Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Peter Burns, CEO of The Arc, the leading community-based provider of services for families and individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Peter has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us. I'd like to thank you, Peter, for joining us today. Well, it's great to be here with you. So we've just lived through the, uh, the vote in the Senate in which the uh, UN Convention on People with Disabilities uh, was voted down, a, a tragic day in which people from both sides of the, the aisle um, literally were begging the Senate to ratify this treaty. And America has been the leader in this field for such a long time, perhaps coming late to the game in absolute terms, but still having made some great strides in the last years. Talk about the arc and talk about the issues that people li living with intellectual and physical disabilities face. Sure, sure. Well, happy to. Yeah, I mean, what happened in, in the Congress with the uh, UN Convention um, being voted down was, was just a tremendous disappointment for so many of us, and, and really a disappointment because it reflects on the United States' leadership in the world, in, in the disability community through, throughout the world. I mean, the United States has been the leader um, in establishing rights for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and other disabilities to be included and fully participate um, in society. Um, and uh, that leadership you know, really dates back to uh, the 1950s when the ARC was established as an organization. You know, the, the ARC today is a civil rights and services organization. So from a civil rights perspective, our focus is on protecting and promoting the civil and human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And from a services perspective, we work to assure that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have the opportunity to be included and to fully participate in all aspects of society, whether it's employment, whether it's um, education, going to school like everybody else, whether it's uh, participating in their church or religious organization or, or just going out and, and uh, living in the community. Um, we're committed to people, be, people uh, being involved. You know, um, as an organization, uh, the ARC was founded in the 1950s. It has always been in its history a parent-led organization. Right. Uh, so it was founded by moms and dads, and, and they started organizing in, in true nonprofit fashion in church basements and people's living rooms. These were families who had a child with an intellectual or developmental disability. You know, at that time, the, the, the term was mentally retarded or mental retardation. Uh, we don't use those terms anymore. Um, but the, the organization was founded at a point in time that if you were a parent and you uh, received the news that you had a child with an intellectual or developmental disability, you most likely would have been told by your pediatrician, why don't you put the kid in an institution and forget about them? And so these were parents who said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to reject that advice, and we're going to try to, to create a better life for our sons and, and daughters. Um, and it, it started in church basements with just families or, organizing, and it has grown over the years um, to, to, well, today the ARC is the eighth largest charity federation um, in the United States. And when you say um, intellectual and developmental uh, disabilities, talk about what that actually subsumes. Sure, sure. Um, intellectual and developmental disability, uh, you know, are, are terms that encompass a lot of different diagnoses. So the most common conditions that people are aware of, uh, for example, um, are Down syndrome, right? Um, autism uh, or autism spectrum disorder, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, fragile, fragile X. But there are literally, uh, you know, 150, 200 different medical diagnoses that involve intellectual disability as um, a major component or, or counterpart. Intellectual disability in a technical sense is defined by a combination of I, uh, low IQ, you know, 70 or below, and then um, challenges in a variety of functional areas. Um, and, uh, you know, on onset before age 18, where developmental disability is characterized by, by onset before age 22 and challenges in a variety of functional areas. Um, in, in terms of, of uh, people living with conditions, there really isn't that much that distinguishes somebody 
who lives with an intellectual disability that requires care um, uh, or a developmental disability that requires some assistance and others of us who live for short or long periods of time with other types of conditions that require assistance, whether it is a matter of assistance for the sightless person, um, a uh, assistance for technical or otherwise for hearing impaired, um, if we break a leg, I need a crutch. Uh, it, it really is a false distinction to create a a cadre of permanently underserved individuals in our society, isn't it? Well, yeah, I, I think it's true. I mean, the reality is that all of us in our lives depend on support from other people. You know, we, at different we, stages we, in our lives, we and, sometimes and, require a lot of support and sometimes right. less, and, and to to a different degree. So, you know, we we depend on our families, we depend on our friends, we we depend if we have a particular crisis, we may depend on the assistance of of professionals, you know, um, so we're all in that sense um, codependent um, and um, need assistance of one another to be successful um, in our lives. You know, for, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they can. What what we've seen over the years is they can live successfully in the community and and uh, participate in the schools and be employed and participate in all aspects of community life, um, but they need supports in order to be successful at doing that. You know, as a practical matter, a lot of the support comes from family members, comes from, right. from their parents and, and their siblings and, and friends, um, but there also is a system of supports that the ARC has been involved in, in building up over the years um, to uh, enable them to be included in, in society. So talk about how that system of supports is, uh, is enabled through the programs of the ARC. Are you a central organization, decentral? Are you okay. a resource to uh, families that are yeah. providing their own support? Yeah. So um, y yes, uh, t um, um, on uh, multiple fronts. Uh, so, so the ARC is really, well, structurally as an organization, we have um, 700 chapters around the country, local state and local chapters. The, the ARC is different from some national charities, uh, many of the, the name brand national charities, in that we have three levels as opposed to two. So we have the national organization, we have state chapters, right. and then we have the local chapters. Um, and um, our chapters um, serve people from cradle to grave. Um, from uh, the earliest point in time with a, a family may Prenatally, a mom may get a diagnosis that, that uh, the family is going to have a child with disabilities up to end of life, life issues. Um, and, um, what our and the goal of our chapters is to support the, the individuals with disabilities and their families throughout the lifetime um, of the individual. Now, you know, the, the chapters are all separate 501c3 nonprofit organizations in their, own, in their individual community. Um, with their own board of directors. So they're very responsive to the local needs um, in their community. And so what a chapter of the ARC looks like in Northern California may be very different than what it looks like in, in Miami um, or in Boston. Uh, but they're all b built in a way that they're very responsive to the needs in the local community. Uh, you know, the three biggest areas of service are related to education, um, and to housing and, and employment. And, you know, that probably shouldn't surprise you because those surprise any of us because those are obviously important elements in, in all, all of our lives. And what, what is really interesting is how this actually functions on the ground because in order to not have a templated organization that may fulfill certain needs very well, but certain needs not particularly well. There needs to be a continual dialogue between those receiving services and the organizations locally that are providing services, their state organizations and the national organizations. Yeah. How does that communication flow work amongst yeah. the various parties to this? Uh, well, that, yeah, that's that's really a, a great question. And you know, as I was describing the diversity of what chapters of the ARC look like, uh, you know, the one thing that ties us all together is a commitment to a set of core values. And so the ARC at the national level, working with our state and local levels, we actually define in writing what are our core values. We define in writing what are the organization's positions 
on a broad range of issues, whether it's health care or housing or employment or civil rights or the, the criminal justice system. And so the chapter has worked together in, in that there's real involvement of our volunteer leaders um, at the local level in defining the positions of the organization. And the, the chapters commit to those and, and work to um, advance them. And your organization basically maps to society. So you have the um, education, uh, preschool through 12, you have other types of education beyond that sort of um, uh, traditional definition of, uh, of what an educational trajectory uh, should be. All facets of life are affected by this, including uh, the criminal justice system. Yeah. So you, you have to actually be equipped uh, organizationally and from a community services basis to, to actually uh, deal in all these different environments. Yeah. What's it like providing services within the criminal justice system, for yeah. example? Well, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question you ask because that's one of the big challenges um, in the ARC as an organization and in, in leading this organization because both in the policy world and in the program world, we have to have knowledge and expertise across a broad range of subject areas, as I was describing, whether it's from, right. from housing um, to uh, criminal justice. I like to think of the ARC as if it were a single large organization. And we, we think of it in terms of our recognizing that you know, um, we have expertise and deep expertise dispersed throughout the entire organization. And our challenge leading the national organization is to figure out how do we tap the talent? How do, how do we ta tap the knowledge? So when you ask about a subject like criminal justice, well, so it just so happens um, we have a, a staff member on the national staff who, who's been very involved in developing, over the years, in developing education and training um, for law enforcement, for court, court personnel and the like. But we also know that we have our state chapter in New Jersey that does a lot of work with victims with intellectual d disabilities. And we know we have a local chapter out, out in California that's doing a lot of work in the criminal justice area. And so we work really hard um, at the national level to tie together those different pieces to harness the knowledge ac across our network and then put it back out to work across the entire network. So you function as a sort of intellectual clearinghouse or knowledge clearinghouse where, where the ecosystem itself is serving itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we're, we're trying to do that, that more and more. That, that's really one of the, uh, um, I don't know, I could call it an innovation in thinking that, that uh, I, I brought in when I came to the organization uh, four, four and a half years ago. You know, we had at the point that I walked in the door four and a half years ago, we had that knowledge base in the area of federal public policy. So you know, we had over the years built a federal public policy shop that is really the, the premier group within the disability community on anything related to fe federal public policy. And we had, we had to start to think about, um, well, you know, we have that in federal pub public policy, but we don't necessarily have that um, orchestrated in the area of program policy implementation and program implementation. So as we started to think about you know, how, do, how do we accomplish that, um, the light bulb went off and we said, hey, we've got that all throughout our network. You know, there's tremendous expertise, and so we have to figure out how to tap it. And one of the interesting things about the ARC is, is um, our executives come and stay. I and mean, one of the big, one of the big, I mean, we have many, many executives, uh, I mean, I can think of a, a few, who, who started right out of college, uh, you know, working at a, uh, one guy in Baltimore, I'm thinking of, work, work, working at a summer camp for kids with disabilities, you know, who, who now is, uh, you know, leading a $30 million um, agency, and he spent his whole career working with the ARC. And I can repeat that story all throughout the organization. Um, our folks, our leaders have so much passion for this cause that they tend to stay a long time. In terms of your uh, governance and, and how that functions, do you have a, a, um, a consolidated governance model or is it also a heterogeneous government model, a governance model where you have boards at each of the different levels? Yeah. So we have, uh, e each of our chapters has, the, has their own boards of directors and then the chapters are corporate members of the national organization. And so the, the chapters all have a vote in determining who serves on the national board, 
They have a vote in ter determining our core values, our position statements, um, any major actions taken by the national organization, the chapters ha have a role. And they are, in a sense, our stockholders, if you use a kind of a for-profit corporate um, analogy. Um, we, so we don't um, dictate to the chapters how they compose their boards. We do, though, have some standards for a chapter to be, a, for a, a nonprofit to be an affiliated chapter of the ARC. And one of the, uh, I mean, obviously they've got to commit to our core values. They, they, they've got to have the um, significant part of their work being serving people with intellectual um, and developmental uh, disabilities. But one of the key re requirements is that they also need to meaningfully involve parents and siblings and family members of people with disabilities in leading the, their organization. So uh, it, it really is a value of engagement. Um, there is no idea that somehow the solution is going to come from, um, from some ex external uh, piece. There might be a collaboration, but it is really uh, engagement in this concept of we're all in this one boat together. Yes, a a absolutely. Um, engaging our, our grassroots, engaging the families and, and, and individuals with disabilities themselves is really key to everything that, we've, uh, that we do. And that drives the, back the into arc. your advoca advocacy as well, because when people are engaged in programs, they are knowledgeable in, in programs. They also become your best advocates, don't yes. they? Yes, and, and that uh, we have seen that as as particularly important in the current climate. You know, now um, in uh, you know the, the end of 2012. Uh, we've been engaged actually all through 2011, all through 2012, literally to prevent the dismantling of everything that we built up over the last 60 years. What is under threat? We're fighting to prevent the dismantling of all the programs and services that ha have be been built up, you know, um, all the programs and services that the ARC has been involved in building over the years to support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. You know, what in the political world are referred to as the entitlement programs are for our constituents, they're a lifeline. It's, in many cases, it's a, it's a matter of life and death or certainly a matter of, uh, of whether they are able to be included in the community. But at the top of the list, Medicaid, uh, SSI Disability, uh, the SSI Disability Program, the Social Security Disability Program, and Medicare. Uh, you know, Medicaid is the single largest source of funding for services and supports, uh, home and community-based services and supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So if a big budget acts were to be taken to Medicaid, that would do extraordinary harm to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Um, when you get past the, the uh, entitlement programs, there are a whole range of what are referred to as the discretionary programs that are also critically important to individuals with the disabilities, whether it's special ed funding or vocational rehabilitation funding. I mean, there are long lists of programs that our constituents depend on um, in order to be able to live a decent life. Are there success stories that, that you'd like to share with us? Well, there, uh, th there are plenty of um, success stories. In individuals, um, I don't know that I can think of one uh, example in particular, but you know, I, I could uh, um, tell you actually about a man, um, his first name's Ricardo, who, who lives in, in the District of Columbia. Um, and this is the kind of, kind of story that's repeated throughout the ARC network. Um, Ricardo, um, ma uh, an African-American gentleman, lives in the dis District of Columbia, um, spent the early years of his life in a state institution. And today, um, he is living in the community he has been working for many, many years um, in uh, a D.C. government job. He's married and ha has a family. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he's someone who was relegated to the institution and, uh, you know, the, the folks said uh, nothing will ever come of him. A and there, there are many, many stories like this throughout the arc of people who are institutionalized that now have um, great lives. How does your funding work? Uh, um, well, so our funding at the national level um, comes from, a good chunk of it comes from our, from our chapters, paying yeah. um, affiliate, paying affiliate dues, and, and then from foundation and corporate and um, individual support um, and a variety of different um, 
project-specific government contracts and grants across our entire network. You know, if, if you roll up the 700 chapters, and it's it's 700 chapters in 49 states in the District of Columbia. So uh, we're everywhere at this point except Vermont, and we're working on that. Um, and it's 700 chapters. If you roll them all up, as I mentioned before, we're the eighth largest charity federation on the Forbes list um, by revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, $3.7 billion in total revenue. 96% um, of that comes from government funding. And that's actually one of the, bi the big challenges um, that we face. Um, the ARC has over the years gotten very good at um, creating government programs to support people with intellectual disabilities, creating the funding streams, and then creating the mechanism to deliver the service. Um, what we haven't been as good at historically, because we haven't really put our mind to it, um, is in really ra raising the philanthropic base for support of the organization. So that's part of your next challenge, is to develop a, a more diverse revenue stream, but on a massive scale, yes. in order to support your programs and to support your yeah. advocacy. Yeah, But to develop the re revenue stream, and, and the big challenge is, is what I call um, moving the arc into the big leagues of America's national charities. And we are as big um, in terms of total revenue um, and bigger in terms of footprint than most other national charities. I mean, the, the only other national charities that have a footprint as big or bigger than ours are, are groups like United Way the, and the YMCA um, and maybe the American Red Cross. Uh, there's no one else in the disability community that has the reach into local state and local communities that, uh, that we do. And there are very few national charities at all that have the reach into communities that, that we do. That we do. Um, unfortunate reality is, though, we don't have the brand recognition, uh, and and that's something that we're working on. You know, the ARC has never historically just has never really paid attention to developing strong brand recognition. It's never really paid a lot of attention to developing a strong philanthropic base of um, support across the entire organization. Um, and that's the challenge that we've been. Um, Chipping away at well, we're we're finding increasingly that uh, nonprofits are shifting their model to not only do great work, not only have great programs, not only execute great advocacy, but also to communicate with their constituents and ensure that they have a compelling marketing message, compelling brand, uh, and compelling communications infrastructure. Uh, in a sense, um, that dialogue with um, with the uh, with your constituents. Uh, compels that type of a response. Yeah, well, you, you're exactly right, and, and those are the area, areas that we are, um, are working. Um, you know, in the four four and a half years since I came on board, we rebranded the organization. Uh, you know, we went from from an organization where there are literally 400 different logos mm -hmm. <laughs> out there to you know, a new logo and, and, and brand identity, uh, um, a, a a declaratory statement that we're for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, a, a tagline, achieve with us, that we're all, we're all about achievement, and we've been helping to support our chapters now in implementing this um, new brand identity and getting them to be much more consistent in, in their messaging, and we've really been venturing out pretty aggressively with, with social media. I mean, one of the interesting things we've been doing with our, uh, we have a, a project called Autism Now. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting things that we've been doing with that is to, you know, build a really s a good website where everything on the site is vetted. Um, so, so pe you know, we're helping people sort through all the clutter of information, you know, that exists um, in, in the online world to access information, in this case, that's vetted by people with autism and their family members and experts in the, um, in the field. So they know when they come to our Autism, autism Now site that they're really getting quality, quality information that, that they can trust. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Well, Peter Burns, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you for sharing the work of the ARC with us. And thank you for your insights. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. It was great.